Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people in the Android community. I'm Huynh Dao, and I'm speaking with... Benjamin Augustin. And uh, we're currently in lovely Turino, Italy, for DroidCon Italy, where we both have uh, spoken. And I was very lucky enough to grab uh, Ben for a little quick chat. Um, where are you based, and how did you get started in Android? So, I'm based in London. Uh, I got started in Android, uh, actually at uni. Uh, I kind of wanted to do, I had to do an internship, I wanted to try something different. Um, I had an Android phone, I was like, cool, I'm going to try and do something with that. Um, I just went into that company, they wanted to do some like first tiny projects and they were looking for just a student to experiment and I started and I just fell in love with it. The, the fact that we build like super fast some application that were right in the hands of users, mm -hmm. uh, that to me was like a powerful experience. I just loved the fact that we had like that quick cycle mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to do more of it. Uh, and then since then, I haven't stopped. So. Your talk is something that I, I feel like I, I know I'm really interested in. So I'm sorry. So the title of your talk is? Let's get functional. But well, what is functional programming? Let's start off with the so, basics. Yeah. Functional programming is, it's been around for quite some time now. Um, it's quite literally the concept of using functions, so mathematical functions, as part of programming. So it, it's kind of a, an idea of saying we can learn from uh, mathematics uh, and we can learn from uh, some concepts we have in there, uh, removing some side effects, uh, trying to simplify uh, to some more basic computation uh, the way we represent uh, our, our actions and our codes. Uh, and in itself, it's really abstract. Uh, okay, like when we explain it, it just sounds super abstract and super complex, and it always feels a bit scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it's not. Uh, and the point is, um, like every single time people talk about like functional languages and pure functional languages and how awesome it is, and like you don't have to use a pure language uh, to be able to do some functional programming. And actually, uh, it's just a nice way to approach a problem and make it simpler. So um, as part of my job at Nevada, so I work at Nevada, uh, it's an Android and iOS uh, software consultancy, mm -hmm. uh, and we work for big projects and small projects alike. Um, but lately, and as Android grows, we work on more and more complex projects and we have to support them. And so I started really kind of going back to my roots. So I have a background in uh, engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done uh, like engineering school and I kind of had to go through math and a lot of different things. Yeah. And I kind of went back to those roots of looking at it and being like, cool, there's stuff we can learn from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I started getting interested in functional programming, uh, trying to approach like problems in a different way. Um, and I'm now trying to kind of feed back that interest that I have into it uh, mm -hmm. and try and like get people to um, look at it without being scared, like kind of looking at it being, oh cool, I can try, tomorrow I can do this kind of small little steps, I can try this out and I'll make my code easier. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll make it easier to work with and uh, I can carry that like to, to my team uh, and, and to the people I work with. So um, what usually we do on a on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. is uh, we write programs on what we call imperative programming. Mm -hmm. uh, we're writing a sequence of actions, so you know, um, assign that value to that variable, then um, assign to that variable the value of that variable plus one to, mm -hmm. to increment a counter. Uh, and, and those are like series of actions, step by step, that we can, we can read them with uh, progressively and that perform in the end the action we want. Mm -hmm. um, and functional programming kind of tries and lifts outside of that just kind of bare bone uh, step by step approach and tries to create a language where we can describe a bit more the intent, what we want to achieve. Um, so less literal and more like less literal, more like more abstract, mm -hmm. and like a nice way of expressing it. I would say like a comparison would be when you write music. Mm -hmm. Like if you're if you're writing music, um, like a composer or an artist is gonna is gonna write using a music sheet with notes, and this is an abstract language that yeah, represents. Yeah the intent, mm -hmm. you know, that this note is higher than this one, the sound is going to be stronger there and lower there. Uh, and we don't reason with uh, the, the more imperative approach, which is just the representation of the frequency and the sound wave. Mm -hmm. uh, you might do it when you try and do some, you know, nice cool like sound effect, like reverb and, and some stuff like that. But those are more like details. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you try and reason with the whole concept of the melody, you don't use that. You use an abstract language. Uh, and I see functional programming the same way I see a music sheet. It's just a way to represent what you're trying to do in your code in a higher language and just make it easier to understand. 
So it seems like, you know, what, from what you're saying is that, you know, and, and you know, I, I feel like as software engineers, developers, um, that, you know, we, we think about a lot about extra abstractions, you know, like bringing these to a high level, but that the manner in which we typically develop imperative is inherently not abstract. Well, it's, it's, it is part of what we do and we mm -hmm. do abstraction and there is a lot we can do even with just imperative approaches. We can have mm -hmm. abstraction like of objects and things. We have languages object oriented mm -hmm. uh, and we can do a lot of refactoring to try and abstract concept away and simplify them as mm -hmm. much as we can. Um, but there's a point where we reach where if we can't abstract um, like pieces of code that are executed, th th those functions, mm -hmm. um, we're kind of blocking ourselves from being able to do some things. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the examples I, I, I usually do is uh, when I, I, I explain uh, in my talk what um, a fold is. Uh, and it's a really common abstraction in functional languages, which is how you traverse through a list and do an operation. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you do that in imperative language is doing a for loop. Right. You yep. iterate with a for loop yep. over a list. Yep. <laughs> uh, and in every step of the way, every item, you perform an action. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you would do it if you wanted to do the sum, it, I have a total, I initialize it to zero, mm -hmm. and then I go through my list, and for each item, I'll put it in that variable. Right. Um, and that is like having a state. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now you have a for loop, and then you have this thing that does a sum. Right. Uh, and if you want to abstract that away, uh, you can try and abstract the function that does the sum, but you can't get rid of the for loop. Right. That, that stays there, because that's yeah. the way you define the fact that you iterate through everything, and you mm -hmm. still need the variable outside mm -hmm. right. to, to, to calculate right. the total. Yeah. Uh, in a functional language, you have uh, concepts like fold that are abstraction over this, and fold is literally that. It says, I'm going through all the items, you give me a function, um, and what I will do, I'll, I will execute that function, I'll take the result of that, and I'll pass it to the next uh, iteration, I'll apply the same function over again, and I'll repeat the process. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I give you back the one value. Mm -hmm. And so if you write fold, you can say, uh, I have my list, I will fold, I will pass plus as a function, and it does the total. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have the for loop anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have the state being handled anymore. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we see is that concept, right. and then plus. Right. And then we can generalize it to do something else. So using the same concept, we can use it to uh, find uh, the maximum in a list. Mm -hmm, right. And so you pass fold and max, mm -hmm. and then you have the maximum value at the end. So we kind of have once and for all the for loop with a state being implemented, and then we just pass functions to it to do different things. That's interesting, yeah. Well, so it's things that we do every day. Like you would do the exact same thing with an object uh, mm -hmm. if you wanted to like strike some like iterator or some other patterns, but uh, we can just maybe extract a bit more by using uh, functional uh, languages and, it, and paradigms. It's so hard because I feel like, you know, when I try to understand functional programming, I still try to frame it in an imperative kind of way. So I'm still thinking in terms of for loops and I'm still thinking of like, it, like you know, iterating that way. So I think like people are already reasoning in, in, in functional ways, but they're just not that like um, easy with the fact of using it for uh, like solving the problems in code. Okay. So if you try and solve your problem in code, imperative approach is you start thinking about your problem and you go step by step. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. Um, I'm going to iterate through that list. I'm going to save that state. I'm going to do this, then do that, then do that. Uh, when, you, when you do it functionally, what you're trying to do is also breaking down the problem. But the biggest concept in functional languages and uh, a lot of functional approaches, you have a huge tool set. You have a lot of stuff pre-built for you. Mm -hmm. Concepts like folding, mapping, filtering, mm -hmm. that already exists. And it, it's kind of a, a tool chain that you can use to break down uh, whatever you want to do in like simplest terms. Mm -hmm. So if I want to find all the elements in the list that have been seen at least once and order them by like, you know, um, occurrence, I can mm -hmm. just go through that list and use those little tools, say, well, I'll filter this, then I'll sort it, and then mm -hmm. I'll do this. Uh, and it's about knowing those components. And if you know, like, you don't need to know all of them. You kind of learn bit by bit, you know a few, and then you kind of try and be like, oh, cool, I can, I can break my problem in smaller pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. And to be fair, most people, like most devs, have already done it. Because you've probably written uh, some uh, like command on on your terminal to do some uh, like bash stuff, and yeah, you probably yeah. used pipe. Yeah. Like you know, I'm gonna cat that file, pipe it to this, grab this to to find those lines, and then count the number of lines. Yeah. 
this is functional programming. This is what it is. It's using tiny little bits of code that are designed to do one thing and do it well, and then chain them together. And each of the little program is a function, and then you just chain them and you achieve what you want. It's basically like playing Legos. Uh, <laughs> like you have that, yeah. a, a bunch of Lego bricks, and it's like, I just want to build this huge, big thing. Uh, and you, you just know the bricks you have, and you kind of try and be like, oh, cool, if I do it in this order, then I have that going into this, going into that, and I have what I want at the end. Okay, so in the context of Android, like, so since we're like an Android channel, like, where does functional uh, programming fit, I guess, in, in the context of Android, and, and where do you find functional programming in Android? So the way I see it, uh, functional programming is a really good tool to express uh, validation, mm -hmm. like working with your data, working with your domain. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way... I tend to advocate for, for its usage is usually uh, in everything that is going to be to do with uh, your, your domain. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the core part of your app that, that does your business logic. Mm -hmm. uh, the things you really don't want to mess up. <laughs> uh, the things that like are really important. Uh, so if I have an application that has to, to handle a list of users and then message them at a certain time of the day uh, mm -hmm. and all that stuff, like all my scheduling logic, the, mm -hmm. the fact that I need to warn that user if this has happened and then that has happened. Mm -hmm. I'll try and express that in like functional ways. I'm mm -hmm. going to try and use uh, imageable objects because I know that it's going to make my uh, program a bit more predictable. Uh, and I'm going to try uh, and use like, pure functions because I don't want side effect because I want every single time I call schedule uh, to, to get the schedule of a certain item, I want to just get something and not trigger loads of things in the background. Uh, and then I try and have pushing towards the edge, the, the, the side effect part, and then you reach the Android part where you're going to be, well, cool, I have everything, and now for that given user, I have my whole schedule and all the alarms, and I want to display them. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and that's the part where you kind of forget about functional programming, and you do whatever you would do normally. So, so, it's, in, so, so it's in the architecture of the code? It's in like the structuring of the logic? It helps for a good architecture, but it can even start at a like, simpler level. Like The first things to do is... Um, if you have a bag of data, like a, an object that represents your domain, mm -hmm. make it imitable. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and, and, and that simple step will make your code a bit more predictable. It'll make it easier to read and with. Right, yeah. Um, uh, and all of a sudden, you just gain something. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, if you have to perform some action on this uh, as part of whatever action you have to perform, ask yourself, like, do I need to do this side effect here? If I have to, you know, I, I I, I want to get all the users, um, find something about the schedules, and then if it's that, then trigger the alarm. Mm -hmm. Then instead of triggering the alarm in the middle of the processing, maybe I'll try and have first something that gets all the ones I need to schedule, uh, and that is completely purely functional. Mm -hmm. And then I'll pass that list to something that says schedule all these alarms. Mm -hmm. And so now I have one thing that I can easily test, mm -hmm. which is just a component to get me everything, mm -hmm. and then I can test the other one that schedules the alarm, which mm -hmm. is a bit more difficult to test, mm -hmm. but on its own, and it's more simple because it just takes the list of the ones I need to schedule. So it's just, it doesn't have to be your whole architecture. It can just be uh, the piece of code you usually have problem with, like the one you, you, you find yourself having to write a lot of tests for. Mm -hmm. Or well, maybe you can break it out in like smaller components and, and make those more functional. Yeah, and I, I like what you said about testing because you know, I, I, you know, I feel like in the community, like we always are talking about testing because it's so it's so vastly important. And I, I really like the idea that that function that functional program can help you making make things like test like testable units of logic. And, and yeah, and it's kind of a, it's an approach to solving problem. And and by applying that approach, by trying to break things into smaller components to make them simpler and functional. Uh, it, they they become easier to test. I feel like a lot of times when you, you when you hear functional program, you're always like like you said like hear it in association with like a pure like functional programming language, or when maybe a particular library that does things in a certain particular way. But I like how you're saying that no functional program can just be like just this portion or just that portion of an app. Yeah, I mean you can have a purely object oriented thing, a really you know old school system, and then just have that one component that has to do a bit of. Uh, shuffling around of the data, data crunching to find some answer, that one function could be purely functional, that one bit in there. Mm -hmm. And that's one step. And then as you go through and do more and more, then you might see patterns emerging. You might see like, oh, I can do this and I can change my architecture a bit to go around that. But mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be the first step. And I think that's that's the biggest key to, to, to get for people is like, there is no need to say, oh, I need to do everything at once. As like just start small and and uh, and go from there. Um, if people wanted to find you on the internet, where can they do that? 
Um, usually either on Twitter or GitHub. Um, so Twitter slash Dolverin or GitHub slash Dolverin. Uh, awesome. So definitely um, if you're even like vaguely interested in functional programming or don't even know what it is or what we just talked about, um, please go check out Ben's talk because it's a really fantastic subject. And, you know, um, yeah. So thank you so much, Ben. And thank, thank, you. <laughs> thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.